When we first got our boat, the generator would start and then turn off. For some reason, it wouldn't stay running, and apparently that had been an ongoing problem because the generator was 23 years old and had 14 hours on it. I researched some of the common problems, and this is what I came up with. It's manufactured by Kohler, and the model is 5E, which means it's a 5,000 watt marine generator. It has a thermal shutdown as well as a low oil pressure shutdown, so the first thing I wanted to do was check the condition of the water pump impeller. I went online and downloaded a manual that showed me diagrams as well as how to do some of the work. I was going to replace the water pump impeller regardless because it was 23 years old. Also, I had no previous history of any repairs that were done to it, so I figured I would have a good starting point just to be on the safe side. Before I started the repair I went online and ordered Kohler OEM parts just to make sure everything matched up. I had to disconnect some hoses and then the whole assembly just pulled off. It was at this time that I knocked my GoPro camera into the bilge. <laughs> It also started to pour down rain at this time, so I used the little pinchy plier things that my wife uses to get socks out of the dryer to try to retrieve the GoPro. While getting the camera was not as easy as I thought, it did allow me to get a lot of different views of the bilge as well as the bottom of the engine. I was finally able to retrieve it and took the parts apart and then put them in a container to get some of the scaling and rust off of them. And I relied on my old friend phosphoric acid that seems to clean everything up really well. At this point I probably should have gone into the garage to get a larger container, but I just kept messing around with the one I had and I put all the parts in there to try to get them cleaned up. Remember, as always, whenever handling acid, never use gloves or protective eyewear. This product works really well, and as you can see, where it's fizzing or effervescing, it's eating away any marine life that might be in there, as well as rust. I had to put the parts in separately because the container wasn't big enough, but you can see all the junk that was inside the passageways and that's the old impeller I was going to remove. Remember never use any protective gloves or anything when handling acid it just gets in the way. In addition to a new impeller in O-ring I got this little yellow rubber shaft to kind of as a connection between the drive shaft and the impeller on the water pump and I also wanted to replace the anode that was inside the heat exchanger. The anode rod is made of zinc which is a sacrificial metal and it wears away instead of eating away at the inside of your heat exchanger. Here's the new impeller and o-ring. The zip tie helps to compress the veins to get it into place theoretically. I removed the old one uh, just with a pair of pliers and inspected everything and I found that ultimately the easiest way to put the impeller in was to use some Dawn dishwashing liquid and just kind of work it into place. You're supposed to keep the veins turning in the correct direction that they came out. Um, I don't know if it really matters if they're in the wrong way or not. I've heard different schools of thought but once they're put back in um, they will only turn one way. You can see the theory behind the zip tie method, but I found it was kind of frustrating to try to get everything in correctly. So after messing with it for a while, I just took the zip tie off, pulled the impeller out, put some Dawn on it, and just twisted it into place, and that seemed to work fine. The new impeller also comes with an O-ring 
uh, that you're supposed to replace and then just make sure you take the old one out because it tends to get stuck and if you have two o-rings it will leak. It wasn't really seating fully, so I ended up taking everything out. And like I said, putting some of that Dawn on there and then just pushing it into place. And then everything went together real easily. Next, you have to put the cover back on, but it's kind of like a butterfly shape. It's not a cross, so it can be out of whack by 90 degrees. Just make sure it matches up when you put it back on. This shows the correct orientation of everything, and then you just put the cover back on uh, with the wear side down, unlike I have here, and then snug the bolts up evenly. I realized the error that I had made before I installed the part, so I took the bolts out and flip the cover back over before installing it. The old yellow rubber shaft that was on the water pump was still good, but I replaced it with a new one since I had the whole thing apart to begin with. You can see the location of the old one, and I just had to reach in with a pair of needle nose pliers and pull it off. Of course, all of this is much easier in theory, and true to form, the little yellow thing fell inside of the housing, and I couldn't get it out. It was at this point that I opened a can of worms. I decided that next I would replace the old anode rod and that came out simply enough and I realized that there was nothing left to it and the part that faced the heat exchanger was totally clogged up so it wasn't working anyway. You can see what a new one looks like as compared to the old one. I tried to stick something up inside of that passageway to see if I could break it free but it was totally clogged. At that point, I decided to just take the heat exchanger off and possibly soak the whole thing in acid to see if I can get it cleaned. That took about two hours to get off because all the bolts were frozen. It is now beginning to rain again. Interestingly enough, this uses seawater to cool the heat exchanger, but it is a closed system with coolant inside. So you can see when I start to take this apart, you can see the antifreeze or coolant rather dripping out. That's what that's from. About 20 years ago, there were bolts that held the black control box down to the top of the generator. Here I'm removing the old zip ties that held the box down. Like everything else on this boat, the repair itself is not difficult, but it's impossible to get to the parts that you need to work on. In this particular case, I can only turn the wrench about an eighth of a turn or less each time. I edited out a considerable amount of time that I spent trying to turn these bolts so I didn't want to bore you to death. Here you can see the thermostat that's on the inside of the generator which is a 160 degree thermostat. 
Once I loosened the hose clamps, it just took a gentle tug to get the hoses off. When I was filming this, it was about 95 degrees with 80% humidity and it had just rained. These are all the old parts and I was going to put them in an acid bath to try to get rid of some of the corrosion and rust and barnacles. Remember, check the zinc anode every 23 years. I thought that one of the reasons the generator kept shutting off was because of overheating, which would have been due to reduced water flow from a bad impeller or clogged up heat exchanger tubes. So I figured I'd get it all nice and cleaned out and eliminate that as one of the problems. Now this just started fizzing. <laughs> Yeah, eating all the wildlife out of there. I ended up going back to the big box store that is blue to get more of this phosphoric acid. And I was able to dunk everything and get it nice and clean. But you can see everything is starting to fizz, which means it's eating all the barnacles. Everything came out nice and clean, and you can see that this heat exchanger is made of painted copper, which I guess is good for exchanging the heat out of the generator. But all the passageways are nice and clean, and I was also going to take this opportunity to sand it a little bit and repaint it. Before I put the new anode rod in, I wanted to just run a tap through the area that it screws into just because I didn't know if the threads were screwed up so I ran a tap through and got it nice and cleaned out and then screwed the new anode rod in. It's important to not use any type of sealing tape because it prevents the electrical connection from occurring and then the anode rod doesn't do its job. Another possibility for the generator shutting off was that it had a clogged fuel filter or it could have had a clogged or defective oil pressure sensor switch so I was going to replace both of those to eliminate those from the probability list as well. If you reach around all the way to the back of the engine where you can't see anything that's where the oil pressure switch is located right behind the oil filter that is also impossible to get to. As always, I use genuine Kohler parts, and that's the new fuel filter. But you do have to reuse one of the little pieces when you take off the old one. And I just wrap them with some sealing, uh, Teflon sealing tape that's rated for gasoline and connected the parts together. This is the oil pressure sensor switch, which has an electrical connection on the top that just snaps on. If that's faulty, it will tell the engine that you have no oil pressure and it will shut itself down. To remove the fuel filter, just make sure the fuel is turned off at the petcock and then use two wrenches to remove the old one. Next I remove the hose clamps that hold the fuel line onto the fuel filter. At this point it's a good idea to inspect the fuel line to see if it has any cracks or splits in it and if it does it's a good time to replace it. Fuel line is inexpensive but you have to make sure that you get the one that is rated uh, for the Coast Guard uh, for marine use. It has a stamp on it. It says USCG and you'll see that in a minute. You need to keep that barbed fitting that screws on the top of that and reuse that. Just use two wrenches to get it apart. 
and also when you're reassembling it, make sure that you use the Teflon tape that's rated for exposure to gasoline. I'm assuming that the existing fuel line was original, so I just decided to replace that. I just loosened the hose clamps and pulled off the old line. Decided to replace the old fuel line. It was pretty jacked up. Heat and temperature take its toll, as well as ethanol that's in the fuel now. Whenever you fill your tank, if at all possible, you should use ethanol-free gas. The alcohol that's in the ethanol-added fuel tends to put holes in the rubber fuel lines prematurely. Also, when putting on the sealing tape, it goes without saying, make sure that you put it on in the direction that the fitting is going to turn so it doesn't undo itself. Then you just reassemble all of the pieces. Since this will now be a part of my regular maintenance, I am imagining working on this in the future is not going to be as difficult as it was this time. Make sure that the new fuel line is USCG rated and it is made to be in an engine compartment that has higher heat than normal. That's the reason the fuel lines are thicker. You really shouldn't be using automotive or lawnmower fuel line. Okay, the new oil pressure switch is installed and the wire is connected. And then the new fuel filter is installed and I also added new fuel line. Make sure that it's the marine fuel line. And then when you're done, turn the gas back on. Also, remember to wipe up any spilled gasoline and have plenty of good ventilation and run your blower before attempting to start the engine. I have to disconnect that line from the seacock and run it into the water pump but it can't be under pressure so I have to hook something up and then run it into a bucket to draw water and then I can test the generator. I just disconnected this hose I used this plastic fitting I'll just put this end into a bucket. Next, run water into a bucket. I put a little bit of water in this hose just to get the air bubble out, but I don't pressurize it. If you put too much water uh, under pressure into the generator, it can get into the cylinder head for some reason. So uh, now that that's filled up, I will go and see if it starts. This is what it looks like when the generator discharges the seawater and exhaust through the through hole fitting over the side. It's finally working correctly. It can also be started remotely from here. 
still on short power. Generator power is off. When you're done, just disconnect this line. Reconnect it to the C-strainer. And then just tighten it up.